I work out of the Newberry office. Um, I work in the Newberry office, uh, again, for Michigan DNR Fisheries Division, and I manage the waters in the Eastern Lake Spear Management Unit, which is basically from Marquette to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and if you drew a line about M28, all of the drainage that goes to Eastern Lake Superior, I'm responsible for. Uh, so I work with constituent groups, uh, reviewing permit applications with EGLE, and as well as all the fisheries management activities um, and interactions with the public within that area. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I think this is the, boy, the fifth or sixth time uh, that I've done this presentation uh, for Tracy and, and with the, the new uh, teachers with the program. So I think that is a super exciting opportunity for the students, as well as all of you. Uh, Sam in the classroom, in my opinion, is probably the most valuable program that we have um, within Michigan DNR. Um, we have a lot of valuable programs, a lot of exciting programs, but this one here has been a pretty long-standing program where students just have a lot of great interaction. And I always look forward to the actual release in the springtime. Um, and interacting with the students and just getting out on the stream side uh, when the opportunity is there. So uh, again, welcome. Uh, this presentation is going to be a little bit of uh, figure heavy, a little bit graph heavy, but I'm going to get into a little bit about trends in the salmon fisheries for each of the upper Great Lakes. So I won't be talking about Lake Erie or Lake Ontario at all. Um, because of where I work and the interactions I have with the public, I talk a lot about Lake Superior, a lot about Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, the northern tiers, um, but I will be covering all of those trends in the salmon fishery and how we evaluate those. So what I'm going to do here is show my presenter view. So on the screen here, we have a brief outline. Again, I'll, I'll talk about our salmon stocking history. Um, I think we all know the story. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Tracy outlined that with our sea lamprey introductions here to the Great Lakes, uh, why salmon were brought to the Great Lakes. But I'm going to talk primarily from stocking from 1970 on, 1979 on. Uh, that's what our database covers, um, our public facing database. So I'll talk a little bit about the trends in our stocking history. Our statewide angler survey program overview, um, that is something that we conduct annually. Uh, both with agreements from our consent decree with the tribes, but also for our monitoring and our evaluation efforts across the Great Lakes. And as well as our angler efforts, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our angler effort and what does that mean to us as fisheries managers and, and how do we use that um, when evaluating and monitoring fisheries. Our salmonic catch rates, so the, the catch rates that we receive and summarize from the statewide angler survey program. Uh, we'll talk about our Lake Huron, Michigan, and Superior trends that we see and typically how we break those down as fisheries managers. And then really at the end here, we'll, we'll talk about where to catch salmon. I think that that's what most folks are most interested in, most excited about. And we'll talk a little bit about how we get some information out to the anglers and in and, and what manner that we do that. So I won't dig in too much on the Pacific salmon stocking. Uh, we, we know it began in 1966. They were brought here as part of a rebuild of a fishery that had collapsed uh, for a variety of reasons, but primarily uh, due to commercial fishing and our sea lamprey um, invasion uh, through the Welland Canal. But they were brought here, Pacific salmon were brought here primarily to rebuild that fishery um, and as well as to prey on our invasive alewives that we have presence here. So that opportunity to rebuild a fishery, but with a really popular sport fish. Um, and Howard Tanner, Dr. Howard Tanner had a, a vision and actually really worked out uh, to the benefit of all of our Great Lakes ports, all of our Great Lakes anglers, and from many people across the United States to come here to the Great Lakes. So it really created a fishery. So our salmon stocking has continued through the years uh, with the interest from our anglers, but as well as the opportunity that has been presented in Huron, Michigan, and Superior, as well as Erie and Ontario as well. But again, we'll focus on the upper Great Lakes here. But with them being here, we knew that we would need to continue stocking them at some um, rate or some fashion on an annual basis or maybe a semi-annual basis and, and see where it was going to take us. So what I'm going to do is overview our salmon stocking for Chinook and Coho, um, the, the sister species to Chinook. But uh, here on the slide, I have the average annual stocking rate by Great Lake. So in Huron, we've averaged uh, since 1979 about 2.2 million uh, Chinook salmon. Uh, Lake Michigan's average right about 2.1 million 
Chinook salmon per year, and Lake Superior, uh, right about 350,000 um, um, Chinook salmon per year. And you'll see why uh, we have uh, discontinued our stocking for Lake Superior. Uh, it was last stocked in 2016. So here's a, a, a line graph showing our number of stock fish um, by year, and that's per each Great Lake. So it's a stocking summary from 1979 to 2022. I do have this updated for this current year. And the reason I'm using 1979 again is we have a public uh, facing database on our website. So it begins from our database internally from 1979. Of course, we do have data before then through the 1960s, even in the early 1900s for stocking. Uh, but a lot of that has been scanned into our database and, and is not available for public facing. But this is something the public can actually um, query and look for a specific port, specific water body or species, and they're able to obtain that information from that database. So for, for this purpose of so this slideshow here, I'm using 1979 through current day on our stocking rates. Chinook salmon are stocked as spring fingerlings. Um, they, we know that they hatch right about this time of year uh, into early uh, December. And then we grow them out to about spring fingerling size, and that's going to be about the three to three and a half inch range. Uh, typically, they'll range a little bit more than that, but it's based on our water temperatures and productivity in the hatcheries through that winter season through their grow. But they are stocked as spring fingerlings. They cost roughly 40 cents to 50 cents a fish. Uh, the estimate I have is 43 cents, but that's based on 2017. As we all know, with the cost inflation that we've been experiencing the last couple of years, I would anticipate that that cost uh, per fish would be a little bit more, at least a few cents more per fish, but um, the range is about 40 to 50 cents per fish. Um, looking at the graph here, Lake Huron, we, we've seen a, a trend um, you know, decline over time, and, and, and that's primarily due to some of the food web changes that we've experienced in Huron and Michigan. But at one point in Lake Huron, we were over 4 million Chinook salmon stocked. Um, that was a considerable amount. Uh, we were the only agency stocking Lake Huron uh, with Chinook salmon at that time. Um, but you can see that that trend has gradually declined since about the 1990 timeframe. Lake Michigan, uh, we were just over 3.5 million at one period. And Lake Superior was always very low comparatively. And that's primarily because we have no alewives present in Lake Superior. Uh, but jumping back to Lake Michigan here real quick, Lake Michigan was a very consistent uh, stocking rate. Uh, it is a much more productive system than what the other two systems actually are. Uh, we just have a little bit more uh, phosphorus, a little more productivity out there, allowing for more biomass or, or more space available for Chinook salmon to occupy. And I want to keep in mind that the reduction in the salmon stocking was really to lessen the pressure on the bait fish uh, populations in Huron and Michigan. Uh, we may be familiar with that early 2000 food web shift um, that we experienced. And with that, we, we needed to reduce our stocking rates for Chinook salmon in both Huron and Michigan. So that's also a reason for this decline here you see on the figure. Now, good news is recently approved for 2023, all the states touching Lake Michigan that stock Chinook salmon, uh, salmon have it, uh, agreed to the increase of about 50% uh, to, to stock them in 2023. So the existing stocking rates will be increased by 50% um, for the coming year. And, and that's something exciting for anglers. Um, and that is primarily due to our shift or our improvement of the forage base that we've seen out there. And we gain that forage base information both by our Marquette research staff, but as well as the USGS. Um, they do trawl surveys in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So they have provided data to us um, with the, the increase in our prey base um, that has allowed us to increase our stocking rates about 50% uh, for those agencies stocking Lake Michigan. So here's a start for our coho average annual stocking um, because it's the sister species. It's also important, um, not part of the salmon in the classroom program, but for informational sake, uh, just to give you an idea of where we are with our coho uh, salmon stocking. Lake Huron, right about 380,000 annually per year. Uh, Lake Michigan, 1.6 million per year. And again, that's going to um, 
uh, be continued uh, for some time, and I'll give you the reason why we have continued that. Uh, Lake Spear um, ha has last been stocked in 2007, but when we did stock it, it was roughly about 200,000 fish. Uh, Lake Spear is completely self-sustaining today um, and no longer requires stocking for coho salmon. Uh, here, here's our figure again, 1979 to 2022 for each of the Great Lakes. Uh, coho salmon are stocked as yearlings, uh, so these take a little bit longer to get to size in our hatcheries, and they're roughly about 78 cents per fish. Again, that's based on the 2017 estimate, and I would expect that number to be quite a bit higher or maybe a little bit higher at least uh, here in 2022. <clears throat> And stocking Lake Michigan, so we, we talked about why that would re remain the same. So that is our sold wild broodstock source for our rearing program. So at Platte River Hatchery, we take our eggs um, at Platte River and we bring coho salmon eggs in from there. And, and Lake Michigan supplies our broodstock source. So that's why we've continued a lot of that productivity and our production for Lake Michigan. But as you can see, Lake Huron and Lake Superior um, they have been discontinued. Um, a lot of the self-sustaining populations that we see around at the ports and a lot of the tributaries have offered that habitat available for coho reproduction um, has not really necess necessitated stocking. Now you have seen here in the last four years, uh, coho stocking has restarted in Lake Huron. And again, that's due to angler demand, but also the opportunity because of the prey base we are experiencing and the increases in the prey base we've experienced in Lake Huron. So now it's allowed more opportunities or more room uh, for additional coho out there. So how do we evaluate our recreational fishery? So this gets into a little bit of, of what I'm looking at or what information I'm using uh, to evaluate our programs, uh, specifically Chinook salmon and coho salmon, but we also do other salmonids and other fisheries across the upper lakes as well. So we have our statewide angler survey program, and it's one very important way that fisheries division evaluates our fisheries statewide. Um, it's uh, formally began in 1986. Uh, it's a Great Lakes Creel. It was part of our uh, negotiations with our consent decree. Um, and it's been worked more uh, intricately over the last uh, couple of negotiations that we have had. Uh, so there are some agreements and ports that we need to monitor, and that's primarily for whitefish, lake whitefish, and lake trout. But we do 65 Great Lake ports annually. Um, that number will fluctuate a little bit based on funding, um, and then also based on that agreement we have within the negotiated um, consent decree. We hire typically, or we have on staff, typically 35 to 40 full-time employees and some seasonal, and those are annual uh, positions. So some are repeated. We have clerks that have been on for 20, 30 years, uh, which is a pretty darn good program for them. Um, it works out really well for retired teachers. Uh, it also works out really well for some students that look for, for some early uh, career um, experiences. And myself, I started as a Creole position down on Lake St. Clair, uh, that was my first position with the Michigan DNR, a uh, full-time position it was. Uh, clerks, you know, they're the front line. They work weekends, uh, early mornings. You know, I, I had some that uh, shifts that ended at 11 p.m. at night, and I had to be back at the port at 6 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, short turnarounds, uh, these late nights, uh, you know, talk to the anglers, come off the water, they're tired, you're tired. But at the same time, that that information is highly valuable. So I really respect these individuals that are out working on the water uh, to really, you know, interact with the anglers, but to gather that um, valuable information that we really couldn't do any other way. So these are really critical for fisheries managers to evaluate fisheries and, and the management of those fisheries. We inter interview roughly 35,000 anglers annually. Uh, just to give you an idea, Lake St. Clair, uh, when I worked down there, I interviewed my first season 6,000 anglers. So I just give you a perspective of how busy Lake St. Clair is compared to Munising. I think Munising, we maybe get about a thousand in a year. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of different volume of activity on Lake St. Clair to, to the range of Munising or even um, the west end of the UP, like Black River Harbor, for example, we might see 60 or 80 anglers in that range. So it will vary port to port, but uh, there are a lot of interviews conducted um, each year. And they interact um, roughly with 35 to 40,000 non-anglers. So on Lake St. Clair, again, I had 6,000 anglers, not counting all the pleasure boats. Um, I would arrive at some of the Selfridge 
air um, air base launch or Fairhaven launch and the parking lot would be completely full with pleasure boaters so I had to weed through them because of our, our airplane counts that are associated with our creel surveys um, we, we had to decipher on the ground which was a pleasure boat which was an angler so I would also have to interact with those non-boating or excuse me those non-anglers as well our creel on average is about three and a half million angler hours so that's what they record across all the Great Lakes um, I do have a figure showing our average angler hours per year, so it'll be interesting to, to kind of see how that trend goes, but um, there's quite a bit of effort that's collected out there across our waters, but that just shows the value of our fisheries um, across the upper lakes. And why are they so important? I've mentioned a couple of times, it evaluates our management actions. So if we change the stocking strategy, um, a number at a port or an actual port where we stock them, are we stocking them offshore? Are we stocking them in a river? So what management action are we actually evaluating? That's what cruel surveys help us um, to look into a little bit further. And they help us gather feedback from anglers on the values and, atti and attitudes and opinions. That's something that we can insert. You know, How do they feel about a specific management action, Was it, whether it's a regulation or stocking? What kind of feedback are we getting from them? Um, do they accept it? Are they not supportive of it? So that's one way we can do it as well. Uh, we can identify trends in the fishery, um, as stated. So maybe we're seeing an incline or a decrease in lake trout catches out of specific grids in Northern Lake Michigan or, or Eastern Lake Superior. And this is one way we can pick those up because the, the data are relatively tight as far as our estimates. Um, so our, in, our confidence is pretty, pretty good on this um, information that we're gathering. So they are very valuable. Um, it is relatively expensive to run our cruel program. Uh, but at the same time, that data is something that we just can't gather any other fashion uh, with like traditional netting surveys, um, so to speak. So angler effort. So I'm going to switch to some data heavy slides here, a couple of slides that are going to be um, looking at some data. And I just want to make sure that we're oriented with the time scale that we're looking at and also our, our Y um, access. So I will walk you through each of these slides as we go. So this first one is looking at all three lakes and angler effort um, for Michigan here on a superior. On the y-axis, we have hours fished. So that's actually a total. Um, that is not an average, it's actually, actually a total. And from 2000 to 2021, uh, the 2022 survey data was not complete yet. Uh, it's probably not complete for another six weeks or so. Uh, that's typically something we, we wrap up. Our creole program will run from typically the springtime, if we don't have a winter creel, through the end of October. Very rarely do we run through the end of November. Typically, our, our anglers are turned into whitetail hunters, um, so they move out to the woods at that time and, and, and not focus so much on our fisheries on the Great Lakes. So thus, we, we pull a lot of our clerks at the end of October. So you can see the general trend. Um, I think we're all familiar with um, hunters and anglers uh, that has been declining the, the effort that we've seen. Um, and I think that this trend shows that as well. I don't think it's specific to any one fishery or why we're seeing fewer salmon or why we see an increase in walleye here or a decrease there. This is just the general trend in angling activity across the United States. So I think if you pulled a creel data from, um, Easter, the East Coast, I think that trend will look very similar to what we're seeing here on the upper lakes as well. Lake Michigan, um, we have a little bit more populous on the west side of the, the state. Um, maybe the fishery is offering a little bit higher um, amount of angling there. But as we can see, Lake Huron has actually caught it in the last five years. And I think that's specifically due to Saginaw Bay and the walleye fishery that we've seen there. So some fisheries can have an influence on how much angling traffic or angling effort we see. But at the same time, it's relatively close. So Michigan and Huron have very similar um, amount of angling effort in, in each year. Lake Superior, always very low. Um, it's much to do with the weather. It's a much bigger water and the productivity, just the numbers of fish. I mean, we have a very tremendous lake trout fishery and even a whitefish fishery at times up here, uh, but just the productivity, the biomass, even though it's a bigger lake, it's deeper, colder, less productivity. It's just not going to carry as much biomass as what Lake Michigan or even Lake Huron will carry. So that's typically why we see a quite a bit less angler effort um, due to the weather, bigger water, but also the populace in general. We just have fewer anglers up here 
um, and with a smaller fishery or uh, a less robust fishery. So that's typically why we've seen that pattern. Lake Michigan on average is one about 1 1.6 million hours fish per year. Um, Lake Huron about 1.2 million hours fish per year and Lake Superior around 170,000 uh, hours fish per year. This is La Lake Superior angler effort specifically. So this is breaking down that uh, trend line that you've seen in the previous figure. Uh, the y-axis is hours fished uh, since 2000 through 2021. And this is a, a more closer look or more detailed look of what that line um, is, is describing. Here in 2007, um, at that time, we actually seen an increase in gas prices. Um, I know that we had some weather challenges that year as well. So we saw a precipitous drop in our angler effort. Everybody knows what happened in 2020. So I think we can almost erase that data point in 2020. And we, we, we actually had less angler effort and we had our creel clerks not even be able to creel in the months of April and May, which are some of the heaviest um, time periods for our angling traffic in the springtime there. So um, we can erase that 2020 mark, but we have seen an uptick here in 2021, maybe an increase in the fishery, but just an increase, an increase in interest in the Lake Superior um, fishery itself. So this is the general trend for our angler effort Lake Superior. This histogram here uh, is discussing our average angler hours, average annual angler hours by port um, on Lake Superior specifically. So we have Black River Harbor, uh, Keweenaw Bay, uh, Munising is on here, Grand Marais. And we, we creel uh, these ports annually. So Becky, our creel clerk, has been doing Munising and Grand Marais for the last few years. Uh, we've had a couple of clerks in and out of Marquette and Aw Train as well as Keweenaw Bay, which they would cover here on Bay, Travers uh, Bay, as well as over to Ontonagon. So we split our creel time between these ports, but this is the average annual angler hours. And you can see, you know, the standard ports that we creel, um, we have maybe a higher average angler hours, but that's where a lot of the populace is. And that's also where our effort is concentrated because of those specific fisheries. Maybe it's the Keweenaw Bay splake fishery. Uh, maybe it's Grand Marais because of the whitefish off the pier. Maybe it's Munising. We have a tremendous splake fishery as well, and some of the smelt fisheries that we have experienced on the ice uh, throughout the year. So this is just a one way that we can look at uh, effort spread out by port um, across the Great Lakes. We can do the same for Huron and Michigan as well. So what is CPUE? Uh, CPUE is catch per unit effort. So what this is, this is the number of fish caught per hour. Uh, this is the number of salmonids. This is not this does not include lake whitefish, this does not include walleye or bluegill. Uh, these are salmonids only, such as lake trout, coho salmon, chinook salmon, um, and, and siskiwet or splake. So fish per hour on the y-axis, and yes, that's a relatively small number, I mean 0.2 fish per hour, but that's represented across all anglers. Uh, this is total effort um, and underneath what number of fish is caught each hour. So the trend from 2000 through 2021, again, our 2022 data is not available until this winter. It, it is interesting to look at this trend line. I mean, over time, uh, we've actually seen an increase in catch. So that would maybe suggest that fishing is getting better. Um, so it, it, that is interesting. We see that um, number in 2007. Uh, it's probably our lowest data point, but that was specifically due to some weather that we experienced that summer, as well as significantly higher gas prices um, in that year. And that's what we always correlate that to. So we saw a, a pretty substantial drop in effort, uh, which would correlate also to the, the number of fish that we caught that year as well. <clears throat> now, you know, again, this is the number of fish caught per hour and not harvested per, per hour. So all your throwbacks count as well. Um, and I think we can see a relatively unchanged trend uh, through this time series until about 2008. You know, we talk about the gas prices in that time frame, uh, but then we've seen an increase in the, the 10 years since then. So, you know, again, fishing's getting better potentially, um, but we are seeing a, a little more interest in our fishery here on Lake Superior as well. So this is that catch per unit effort and angler effort on the same figure. So from the same time series, 2000 through 2021, uh, the y-axis uh, is your hours fished and your um, y2 axis on the right side of the figure is your fish per hour. 
So this is just one way we can compare um, our effort and our catch per unit effort uh, to see if this is something that's correlated or, or maybe uh, there's a separation in the two lines. But when you overlay these, you know, despite the uh, de decrease in the total effort, uh, the catch rates have actually slightly improved. So, you know, that's kind of interesting there for us. So maybe we're just seeing more anglers um, having more success um, in, in each of their trips. But it's just one way to determine how successful the anglers are during their trips. Oh, I jumped ahead. Uh, Salmonids harvested on Lake Superior. So this is, these are all Salmonids, and they're all represented in the legend here at the bottom of the graph, um, at the bottom of the histogram. Uh, number of fish harvested, uh, this is total. Uh, this is not a rate. This is actually total harvested. And in most years, you can see that the lean lake trout has dominated the harvest with coho salmon and ciscoettes making up a large portion of the harvest each year. Uh, the Lake Superior fishery remains diverse. Um, but you, as you can see, Chinook salmon have remained a small component of the fishery. So we have stopped stocking Chinook salmon in Lake Superior. Uh, the last year was in 2016. And even during the years when we had stocked um, through 2016, you can see where Chinook salmon was always a very small component of the fishery. Um, and I have another figure to show you um, how that uh, correlates to our stocking as well. So this is just another way we can look at catch composition or harvest composition for each of our Great Lakes. And this is, again, Lake Superior from 1987 to 2021. So let's talk about salmon harvest in each of the Great Lakes. So I'll start with Superior. I'm most familiar with Lake Superior. I manage this. Um, it is interesting. So our top line, I don't like using red on the graph, but it was the best way to depict it from Chinook. So our top line is coho. Um, I have a little picture of a coho here and a little picture of a Chinook salmon. Our, our coho salmon, harvest from 2014 to 2018, we saw a pretty significant increase. Um, we believe that this was likely due to higher water, um, water level trends that we'd seen during that time frame, and as well as increased groundwater and streams. So what happens is when we see an increased spawning run, we have increased recruitment, which would typically tell us that now we have more fish in the system and more fish to run each, each fall, um, and as well as springtime fishery so our springtime fisheries off of Grand Marais, even Munising and off of Marquette um, can be pretty impressive at times when our coho jacks return uh, to the mouths of the rivers and anglers do really well, uh, simply just trolling a hot and tot. Uh, nothing too trivial really there, but as long as you can get out on the water, uh, maybe on a south, south wind day, you can troll relatively near these river mouths and have some success. So um, our coho fishery has always been uh, pretty good, um, but we have seen a, a pretty substantial increase here over the last um, you know eight, nine years um, for those coho. Chinook, again, ha has always been low and it's been right around 1500 um, Chinook harvested per year. And if you look during this time frame, it was all the years and when we had stocked Chinook as well. So since then, we have been relying on self-sustaining populations or natural recruitment, and that has carried the, the low number um, that we have experienced through the years for Chinook salmon harvest. Lake Huron, a little different scenario here. Uh, I'll start with coho salmon, the red line here on the bottom. They've always been very steady. Uh, you know, that, that fishery there has been very nominal, um, albeit present, but just relatively nominal compared to what Chinook salmon were at one time. I'm going to assume that you can see when the crash had happened for Chinook salmon. It was right around that 2003-2004 time frame. Uh, you know, in 2002, we were riding pretty high with harvest. 2003, I think we felt still pretty good, but we didn't really experience any precipitous drop until that 2004 and then ultimately 2005. And that's where we have remained since then. So our expectations should be right around these numbers for Chinook and Coho moving forward. And that's based, again, primarily on those changes in the prey base and those food web dynamics, which, uh, you know, you may have heard before um, and, and maybe be familiar with for Lake Huron. Lake, Mi Lake Michigan, a little different scenario again, uh, but a similar trend to what we see in Lake Huron. Uh, the, the decline for Chinook was, you know, a little bit more delayed than what we had seen and in, in experienced in Huron, again, because Lake Michigan is a much more productive system than what we have in Lake Huron. So keep in mind, Lake Huron is receiving all of Lake Superior's water and as well as Georgian Bay, plus 
you know, you have a lot of natural shoreline and undeveloped shoreline um, and, and unpopulated shoreline on the east side of Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. So therefore, we just don't have that productivity. Whereas like Michigan has many major cities located along the shoreline. So we just have a lot of more uh, productivity entering the system, which can hold a, a higher biomass or a, a potentially higher biomass of prey fish, which then correlates to how many Chinook salmon can be held or predators can be held in the system. So Chinook salmon in this time series, yes, they're gradually decreasing, um, you know, and more so than here on a superior. And unfortunately today, Coho and Chinook are relatively similar in the numbers that we have harvested. So hoping to turn that back around, but again, it's completely uh, relies on the prey base that we have in Lake Michigan. And again, as we mentioned, for 2023, we are seeing about a 50% increase uh, in stocking rates uh, coming. So hopefully that'll be for, for the better. Overall, Chinook harvest. Um, this is across all the upper lakes. Superior is the blue line, very, very small, very low for Chinook harvest. Um, you know, we talk about why the food web dynamics changed in here on in Michigan. We know the zebra and quagga mussels as they entered in the 1980s through the 1990s. Now we are today with heavier quagga mussels out there, uh, which they filter the water, removing and sequestering a lot of that energy away from the food web. But we also had the Clean Water Act of 1972, so I don't want to forget about that. I mean, it was a good thing, obviously, the way that water treatment facilities handle their waste and their productivity and the amount of phosphorus entering the system, but at the same time, that also removes it from the system. Um, so I think that that has had a lot of substantial changes and, and removed a lot of that potential energy that could be entering that Lake Michigan as well as all the Great Lakes. But um, Clean Water Act has definitely um, has been a success story but at the same time has removed a lot of the productivity. So I, I do believe that both of those have been a culprit and the change in the food web, but uh, hopefully here in the, in the future, we can base things on what the prey um, and forage availability looks like with our stocking rates. So I mentioned a couple of slides back and looking at stocking and catch rates together for Chinook salmon. So in 2016, we had decided to stop stocking Chinook salmon. And this is one way that we've evaluated that. So on the y-axis, we have the number stocked. Um, that would represent your gray bars. And on the, the right axis of the y2 axis, we have the recreational harvest, and that's the black line. So you can see even in the years before we even considered to stop stocking, uh, we had seen a precipitous decline in the amount of recreational harvest for Chinook salmon. So therefore, it was basically telling us hey, look, our, our stocking isn't really doing a whole lot. Uh, we're spending a considerable amount of money on stocking these Chinook salmon. So it looks like it's, it's maybe time to move on and just rely on our natural reproduction that we have in the system. So we do think that there were some changes in the fishery um, and, and it's likely and largely due to the recovery of our lake trout um, and lake trout fishery in Lake Superior is the dominant fishery. Um, but at the same time, we knew that there wasn't a lot of room for Chinook salmon in the system, our harvest was reflecting that. So therefore we had stopped stocking Chinook salmon in 2016. So this is just one way we can piece all of those puzzle pieces together and show us a bigger picture on how we can move forward with management. So I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit uh, with salmon ecology in Lake Superior. Uh, I, I do think the dynamic in Lake Michigan and Huron may be a little bit different just because you have more warm water bays um, involving walleye and yellow perch and, and other species, but specifically for Lake Superior, I get questions a lot about, you know, what do they eat? Uh, what do they have out there? What's, what's the diet and, and, and why don't uh, salmon do so well? Um, or why can they do well in certain systems or certain uh, situations? So for Lake Superior, you know, we primarily have smelt and sticklebacks, uh, but Chinook salmon, um, they can feed on coragonans as well. So ciscos and whitefish. And, you know, along our shorelines um, in the relatively shallower waters, uh, not so much the deep, deep waters, and we're talking 800 feet, 700 feet, um, and, and more of the benthic areas, more in the upper areas in the upper column of Lake Superior, this is where this Chinook salmon will be interacting with rainbow smelt, the sticklebacks, um, as well as any of the corgonies that we have out there. So we just have a lower density than what we typically see in the Huron and Michigan uh, more productive systems. So I think that's probably why our Chinook haven't taken off so well and haven't done so well over the years. Uh, we have seen years where rainbow smell have had an uptick in population and density, 
Uh, but at the same time, uh, we haven't really seen the correlation with Chinook or even Coho uh, for that matter uh, to relate to those populations. But lake trout, they still do really well on other species, uh, more bloater, um, deep, deep water ciscos. And I think that uh, that's why our lake trout have done so well here. Um, the habitat is working and we, you know, we talk about how they become self-sustaining, um, how does salmon do that? Uh, our spawning habitat at the Great Lakes tributaries, we have a lot of road stream crossing replacements, um, habitat improvement projects with our partners, our conservation districts, uh, partners like Trout Unlimited and others. Um, they've had a lot of success stories in improving spawning habitats and, and actually ability for accessing more stream mileage uh, with the road stream crossing. So I'm actually involved currently with about four road stream crossing replacements right now that would open up many miles of stream uh, for, for salmon to have access to. So um, also the rebounding water levels, uh, we, we have seen that. I know here in the last year or so uh, has declined. It's maybe um, gone back down to average, but during the high water years, we do see where our salmon uh, respond uh, and they respond well. So briefly, I'll touch on, you know, where to catch superior salmon. Uh, this is a pamphlet that we put together a few years ago for each of the upper lakes. Um, I do believe Lake Huron um, and Lake Erie, Lake Michigan all have the same plant as well with the Michigan DNR. But this is one way we could highlight uh, for anglers where they can catch fish. So we have a time of the year um, and what species you can expect at each port. And again, this is available on our website. We had these as handouts at one time at our customer service centers and um, the public, they always you know, call uh, in the springtime, call during the winter to plan their summer trips and, and where can they go? And, and this is somewhere that I point them to, or maybe I use as a reference. So this is just another reference for you as well, uh, maybe using in your classroom. Uh, for superior streams uh, and rivers, so I broke this out to Western Lake Superior Basin and the Eastern Lake Superior Basin. Um, here near Marquette, Municine, Grand Marais, um, you know, we have the Chocolate River. We, we do have a pretty decent um, salmon run there. Um, I know in the last couple of years, I've gotten some challenges on that, that run. But at the same time, I do know that we have success in our fixed site sampling surveys each year. So we are seeing some coho recruitment um, and as well as some Chinook recruitment there as well. The Anna River, it just seems to be a coho factory. Um, we have a fixed status and trends station located on the Anna River um, off of Munising Bay. And we continually see coho salmon every year in that sample. But um, these are just some of those streams that we experience more moderate um, to better runs for our um, coho salmon and Chinook salmon. So when I point anglers a direction, this is where I typically send them. And with that, I just would be happy to take any questions you might have, but mostly I'm very thankful for your participation in the Sam in the Classroom program. Again, I think it's, a, it's an excellent program for you all to be involved in, and it's an excellent opportunity for the students uh, to really know about ecology and the rearing practices and, and really putting something together into animal husbandry and taking care of something. So I think it's a high value program, but um, I appreciate your time and thank you for um, making me making you wait for lunchtime. So this is your chance. You have a captive biologist. Pick the brain. Um, like Corey said, so he's super supportive of the program. Like I said, there's a lot of people in the UP that are um, more so than I think even other parts of the state. You guys are a little spoiled in that respect. So. <laughs> Um, don't feel bad reaching out because they they're happy to help. They like making the connections. So, any questions? And and this is my office number. Um, I've just kept it on here. I, I do check my office periodically, but you're you're welcome to contact me through my cell phone number as well. Um, so you know if you can track that down, or I can share that with Tracy, and she can share that with you as well. So you can contact me directly. And if you have any questions or if you'd like me to interact in the classroom, do a short presentation or just interact with questions and answers with your students, I'd be happy to do that as well. Well, thank you, Corey, so much for being here and wrapping up our day for us. Yeah, um, no problem at we'll all. See you next time. And I did record this so we can share this. And if you guys want to go back and review any of it, um, it's all available as well. So. It's, I know it's overwhelming. It's a lot of information in one day. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Corey. No problem. Um, so for all of you, do you have any other questions for me?
tank stuff, fish stuff, egg pickup tomorrow. Anything else you can think of? What do we need to do with our eggs when we pick them up tomorrow? Well, first, where are your eggs going to be? So for Thompson, they're going to be in the um, gazebo. little gazebo. There you go. That's the word I was looking for. I get dumber as the day goes on. Um, so they're going to be in the gazebo in a cooler box next to it full of salmon food. So you're going to grab a gallon bag of that salmon food and a baggie of eggs, a little sandwich bag. It looks like there's nothing in there. 125, 150 eggs would fit in like a quarter measuring cup. It's not a large mass, but there's a lot of little fishies there. So you're going to pick those up in the gazebo at Thompson. Again, you don't have to see a human if you don't want to, um, but you could do their self-guided tour. You just follow the little fishy printed on the ground and you can tour the whole facility yourself. No problem. You can go in the building, chat with someone if you find someone. <laughs> That's usually the hard part of Adri's. Um, And then at Marquette, again, they're going to be just outside the fence. You'll see a cooler in a box sitting against the fence outside. Um, if the snow's really deep, sometimes you put it on a table. Otherwise, it's just on the ground right there. And you can pull right up, hop out, grab your stuff. Um, again, they have a self-guided tour as well. So if you want to go wander around the hatchery, you are welcome to do so. If you go pull up past the gate up the hill, um, you can go in their main visitor center door and go see the exhibits they have. So definitely take advantage of that. And they do do field trips. So they don't have educators at either of those facilities, but they're pretty good at doing field trips um, if you book those for the spring or even the fall. Um, so you can take students there and hang out, especially those of you that are close. And then the others, you can hit up, you know, Porky's or... Uh, Quamanon and get them involved. So, um, and then when you take your eggs back tomorrow, you need to acclimate them. So again, tuck that bag in the tank and just kind of pin it with your lid and let it sit every five or 10 minutes, like go, you know, clean the whiteboard and then go back and take a scoop of water, pour it in the bag, pin it again. And then like five minutes later, go back and take another little scoop of water, add it to the bag. When the bag feels like the tank and your temperature is about the same, just go ahead and dump them in the tank and then you're off and running. Um, leaving the light off overnight helps them, you know, acclimate, reduces the stress a little bit. And then um, I got a message back from the biologist. So Randy Espinoza is the bi biologist at Thompson. And he said, your eggs are slated to hatch on December 21st. So if you're in your email, you got an email from me like a half an hour ago saying, if that butts up to your winter break, you are welcome to adjust your chiller up a couple degrees because a little bit warmer water will make them hatch a little bit earlier and they might hatch on Monday rather than Wednesday so the kids get to see it. So you don't want you know them hatching over winter break when no one got to watch. So if you need to adjust the temperature on your chiller just a touch, you are welcome to do that. Just don't go outside that 57 degree mark um, and you should be fine. And they definitely will not need to eat before winter break anyways. Um, it's going to be well after break. So adjusting the temperature is not going to mess you up. It'll just make it so that the kids get to, you know, see it, which is always a little nice, right? You don't want them hatching when nobody's there. Um, and it helps you get all those eggshells out before you go on break and it messes up your water quality. So, so for you, that's going to be the big thing. Check for dead eggs, check for dead sack fry and get all those eggshells out of there before break. Check your water levels and make sure your ammonia and nitrate aren't too high, but otherwise over break, that's all you should have to check is ammonia and nitrate. So if you hadn't cycled by then, that's what you need to keep an eye on. If you're cycled and all the eggs have hatched and you've gotten the eggshells out, yeah, and <laughs> stop, drop, and run. You should be totally good for all of break. So if you're heading into break and you're not really sure what you need to keep an eye on or where what you might need to be doing, let me know and send me your water parameters and we will fix it right up. So I just got my first fish loss email of the year, like five minutes ago. I was looking at his stuff. He had super duper duper toxic ammonia and nuked all his fish. So it happens. Um, but yeah, and then, so I told you when they're hatching, I told you about tomorrow. I think that's it. Question on that. Um, just put the bag of eggs just like on ice or should we have like some water with ice in it? Uh, nope. So um, what yeah. we recommend is like six pack size cooler and then take a Tupperware dish, you know, like the sandwich meat size one that fits in that cooler take a sandwich size bag of ice. So throw the ice in the bottom, put the Tupperware dish on top, put the bag of eggs in the Tupperware dish. Cause that way if they leaked, it'll catch it, but also it provides a barrier. So they're not sitting right on the ice. That's it. Close the lid and go. Um, so pretty informal, but yeah, you don't need a 
cooler smaller coolers are actually better and some sort of barrier between the bag of eggs and the ice so some people use cardboard some people use dishes we prefer dishes because that way it'll catch water if it leaks by chance but um you guys they double bag your eggs usually so you're good <laughs> they're not good like down here we have like one out of every 100 or 200 bags pops and you'll go to pick the bag up and it's like a bag of eggs with no water so we always just you know put it in a tupperware dish but they double bag yours you're good any other questions doing good okay um so two of you did not give me pick numbers so if you do want sketches make sure you go give me a pick number you can scroll through the chat and grab that link um and then that should be it you should have received an email or earlier today from Polly. So gray P at michigan.gov. She emailed Permo or at least she said she was going to. Um, so you should have those. If you don't have them by the end of the day, email me or email her going, Hey, I didn't get it. And then, um, you should be set for tomorrow. It, again, it does not have to be you that picks up eggs. They just need to have your permit in their possession. So they can have it on their phones. They can have it, you know, print it out, whatever it is, but they need to have it in their possession. Anything else? Okay, look at that. Sorry. Oh. I'm not seeing a link to add my pick number oh, on maybe here. Grab it again. Yeah. It times out. Oh, and you came back in, so it probably dropped it for you. Yeah. Let me throw it in there right now. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, pick number at some point before Wednesday and then pick up your eggs tomorrow and you're off and running. So if there's any concerns or issues or anything, you guys can always shoot me a message. Like I said, it's my cell number in my email signature. So you can text, call, whatever you need to do. So you guys are off and running like 23 minutes early. You can reclaim a little bit of your life. <laughs> All right. Well, she has not sent an email yet. Okay. Yeah. So just check by the end of the day. Um, okay. and she'll get it out to you so great thank awesome you. thank you all for sticking in there and hanging out today and good luck thank you thank you bye thank you you are welcome